just like we did 40 years ago. Um, I don't really want to do this at, at all. This is really, um, I, I don't know who in here can understand this moment for me because this is the LBJ, what is it, LBJ? Library. And, 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 and see, LBJ, he didn't know it, <laughs> but he was a major influence in what we were doing in East Harlem and Harlem. Uh, I remember somebody running over to me. I was uh, directing my little, let's see, 68. Uh, it must have been my four-year-old theater group. We started in 64. And somebody says, Michael, if you get a proposal in to my office, we can get some money from the, the war on poverty. And I'm saying, the what? The war on poverty? <laughs> and they said, yeah, the LBJ's program. And, uh, and I'm saying, Okay, and by Friday I had my proposal in. And that proposal yielded my first grant of any sort. It was $15,000, but it's, it was the way that my um, little daycare center theater group became a, come here, <laughs> became a community theater that existed until the 80s. Um, yeah, I, I, I come from a generation of people who, um, <laughs> I had hair then. Uh, <laughs> you'll see me up there somewhere as a, as a young actor with a big old afro. And in one case, you'll see me, me in white face uh, holding an American flag, wondering uh, wherefore art thou? Um, these were, it was a, uh, it was a really remarkable time when there were many of us who really <coughs> took John Lennon at his word and said, um, you know, I'm thinking of Imagine and the, the last lines, you may think I'm a dreamer. but I'm not the only one. There were some of us who really believed that. We really believed that the world was going to get better, that somehow wars would end, and that's why you have to read what you wrote. So, yeah. <laughs> Needless to say, I'm very glad to be here. And, and, I, and during, during this, my little speech, so I'm not going to be long, Jim. Um, but uh, I really have to pay tribute, and I'm going to say some names that you will not know. Well, you will know Geraldine Fitzgerald. You might know her name, and you'll see her up there on the screen somewhere. But uh, it was Geraldine who uh, uh, I remember running to and telling that we had gotten a grant. <laughs> and she said, you're on your way. And that was, you know, 68, my God, how many years ago? There's a certain discomfort in being the lone survivor of a quartet of founders. Uh, when you're the lone survivor, you're faced with the awesome responsibility of getting everybody's name right and the years when and the people who and all of that. And if you don't get them right, people think you're, you know, an old fuddy-duddy, what is it, a fuzzy thinker, <laughs> fuzzy thinker. Make no mistake, we did not invent street theater. The rich traditions of the genre go back to the Middle Ages. The ideas of a people's theater still haunts the stage. It has been an urgent item on the agenda since the French Revolution, which produced <laughs> many rousing manifestos in its behalf. Michelet called on the theater to nourish the people with the people. In the 60s and 70s, the possibilities of a true people's theater had, like so many other embattled energies, gone into the streets. 
You might recall that much of the discord of those turbulent decades was conducted in the streets, on marches, and sit-ins, wait-ins, even pray-ins. Street theater of one kind or another sprang through the cracks of social dislocation and disadvantage. Groups like El Teatro Campesino, my group, the East River Players, uh, the people who first produced Snakes, Snakes in the Grass, the New Heritage Theater of Harlem. They went, uh, street theater took place in the fields where the migrant farm workers acted out the evil and the absurdity of their condition. And there were black, Hispanic, Chicano, and other groups that sprung all over America's inner cities. In New York City, the street theater tradition goes back to 61, when a director by the name of Phoebe Brand and producer Patricia Reynolds began touring the streets of New York with classics of Moliere, Chekhov, and Lorca, along with the goodly dose of fairy tales. New York City also had Peter Capani, still alive, who's New York whom the New York Times call America's leading playwright of the streets, creating works like Street Jesus and The Blind Junkie, which are now considered street theater classics. In Washington, D.C., there, there was a group called Careers for uh, Workshops for Careers in the Arts, now called the Duke Ellington School under the direction of Michael Malone and the amazing Peggy Cooper Kaferts, performing amazingly con complex theatricals. These efforts later coalesced into what I just said, the Duke Ellington School of the Performing Arts. In California, there was Bud Schulberg's White Watts Workshop. In Dayton, there was Clarence Young and his Theater West. All over the country, groups were taken to the streets Sometimes because they wanted to be in the streets, and other times because they had to be in the streets. Around 1968, Geraldine Fitzgerald and a uh, Franciscan monk by the name of Brother Jonathan Ringcamp, they created the Everyman Company, based in Coney Island. The first production was an adaptation of the medieval morality play Everyman. They called it Everyman and Roach. Based on an open door, everybody come policy, the theater company grew fast. Jim Lawrence, a member of my own company, um, was selected to be every man, and it was he who introduced me to Geraldine, a meeting which proved to be very fortuitous in my case. She had friends like, uh, she had thoughts like um, that there should be a people's theater a theater of social change, grouped under the title Street Theater. And a real bond of friendship came, and we were joined at the hip, as they say. In the 70s, we strategized to bring five everyman companies to Lincoln Center for what was the first street theater festival at Lincoln Center. This past year, we celebrated the 40th anniversary of that. Uh, the festival at Lincoln Center is now called Lincoln Center Out of Doors, um, politically more correct. Um, that's sort of an overview of the history of street theater and, and my affiliation with it. And then I'm going to turn it to Jim to talk about this further. Thank you, really. It's starting to get a little intense. It's, it's great, Michael. Thank you. Um, listening to Michael talk, I'm, I'm starting to feel a little bit like Rip Van Winkle. Um, it was really 40 years ago that we did uh, African Medea. Um, 43 years ago since we st first started working together. My story, very briefly, is that I came to New York at the age of 22 from Wisconsin wanting like thousands of others before me to be a writer. My job was with the welfare department. 
and one of my co-workers had been acting with a th street theater troupe, the New Heritage Repertory Theater, run by Roger Furman that Michael mentioned. I sent R Roger a one act, and miraculously he agreed to do it. It was No Snakes in This Grass. It was the first play I'd ever had produced. It was done in streets and playgrounds on some very sweltering summer evenings under the auspices of Lyndon Johnson's War on Poverty. And as you've seen, it's, it's a comedy. But given the time, this was the 60s, remember? The time of the Civil Rights Movement, the bombing of churches, the fire hoses in Selma, of police dogs and jailings. It hit a nerve. And the play began to be produced all over the place, in other street theaters, but also in tiny church colleges in the Midwest. In 1967, I began teaching a playwriting workshop at a theater arts center in East Harlem, where I met Michael, who had a theater troupe all of his own. We became friends, and after a couple of months, he asked me if I would be interested in doing an, a uh, an African adaptation of Medea. I had reservations. I would be a young white Midwesterner writing for a black troupe. I was far from an expert on Africa or the slave trade. And my secret and rather crude opinion of Greek drama was that you couldn't have paid me to go to a play with, where people were wearing togas. <laughs> I had no business really writing this play. But I was young, I was dumb, and I was hungry to get anything I could on stage. It took me about two minutes to say yes. How long did it take me to write the play? Three months, four months. I did research in the New York Public Library by day, sat up at night with Robinson Jeffers' version of Euripides at my elbow. What I was only dimly aware of when I was started was that I wasn't writing about Africa in the 19th century so much as I was writing about Harlem in 1968. The play was obviously about race, but it was also about the going, ongoing debate over violence and nonviolence in the civil rights movement. I think Stoli, Starkley Carmichael versus Martin Luther King, that's, it was part of it. About the cost of retribution and about the building tension in the streets that anyone white or black would be, had to be deaf or blind not to be aware of. The night of the initial read-through was in early April. The brilliant young actress named Dietra Lambert who'd been cast in the role of Medea, didn't show up. And, when, and no one had heard from her. Michael was, very, was fuming. When she walked in an hour late, he was ready to dress her down in front of everyone, but he, he could tell as soon as he saw her that something was wrong and said, what happened? And she said, didn't you hear? She said, Martin Luther King's been shot. So the, the night of our first rehearsal turned out to be the first night of the Harlem riots. It was two years later, thanks to the forceful vision of Geraldine Fitzgerald that the play was performed again at Lincoln Center Street Theater Festival. I remember the New York Times reporter being quite entranced by the young actor carrying a live boa constrictor. After that, Michael and I had a couple conversations about doing, about what we might do next, and I kept bugging him about how he needed to do No Snakes in This Grass. We'll do it. We'll do what he kept telling me. We just need to find the right time. And then, as so often happens in the theater, we each went our own way. Decades pass. Then one afternoon last spring, I walked into the Mitchner Center for, and, uh, where I work, and Debbie DeWeese, our graduate coordinator, was on the phone looking very quizzical. She covered the receiver with her hand so that the person on the other end wouldn't be able to hear. Jim, did you ever write a play called African Medea? <laughs> yeah, I said, back in 1968. Well, she said, there's someone on the phone who wants to talk to you. It was Michael. And when you haven't talked to someone for 40 years, there's a lot of catching up to do. Um, Michael had been running that theater for another decade before going back to Georgia and turning himself into a university professor. The reason for his call was that a young woman in the drama department of a historically black college in Savannah uh, wanted to do a uh, Medea, and he had some ideas. He said, look no further. I have the Medea for you. I, the only trick will be finding finding where that playwright is and where the script is. And one of the wonders of our age, of course, is uh, that with Google you can track anyone down. <laughs> uh, Michael's plan, if I was agreeable, as he would direct the play in Savannah, uh, I was stunned. And as a writer, you become resigned to the fact that most of what you write disappears like pebbles down a well. But still, African Medea was 40 years ago, and that's what you call one deep well. A month later, I met Michael in New York, and we had a reunion of all the actors in Michael's troupe. It felt like old times, and all the stories flowed about what it had been like to perform in parks and basketball courts 
with bent rims, of having to deal with gushing hydrants and crying children and passing boom boxes, of putting makeup on in the back of school buses. It was dismaying how much that I had forgotten. Michael had put together a slideshow, which actually you've seen tonight. Photos of a thousand people gathered on the plaza of Lincoln Center, of Mayor Lindsay introducing everyone, uh, of everyone in their afros and dashikis, of the New York Times coverage. And looking at those old pictures, I was struck by two things. First of all, that we may have done something that mattered, and secondly, how young we were. <laughs> 24, 25, it's amazing, really. Uh, we'd all been in our mid-twenties, and we had no idea what we were getting into. We'd been flying blind. And at the end of our evening with the cast, Michael told me that he had an appointment with some guy at Lincoln Center. Did I want to go, he wanted to know. I very nearly said no. There's something called pushing your luck. But in the end, I said yes. We, 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 and we went to see a young administrator called Bill Bragan, who listened to our stories about street theater and Gerald and Fitzgerald, about the everyman troops and all the shenanigans that had gone on during those first festivals at Lincoln Center. And then he said, well, maybe we should do something again next summer. So when Michael and I walked out of that meeting, we were a little we were sky high, really. We went wandering past Avery uh, Fisher Hall and the Metropolitan Opera House, looking at all the possible performance sites. And what exactly were we going to do? For obvious reasons, we were both drawn to the idea of doing African Medea, but the logistics were daunting. We would be dealing with a large cast. Michael was living in Georgia, and I was living in Texas. Plus, the running time was two hours. And what we needed was something simpler, something more hit and run in spirit, which was what the vast majority of street theater really was. And when, then when we passed the grove of trees in front of the Vivian Beaumont, and I don't know who had the idea first, but we both looked at each other. <laughs> you had the idea. Does this look like the Garden of Eden to you, Michael said? I think it does, I said. So last July, we presented our play at Lincoln Center. The cast you've just seen was terrific. Passionate, funny, inventive. One of my biggest worries was that the play would seem dated, but I couldn't have been further off base. Judging from the faces of the audience, from the looks of worry, of disbelief, and genuine upset when the, jaw, when the taunts and the jibes begin to fly, the issues that the play ad address seem very much alive. Uh, there were at least a couple dozen veterans of street theater in, those, in the audience, of the survivors, really old friends of mine and of Michael's. And after the play, nobody wanted to leave. We must have stayed a couple hours just talking in that grove of trees. Several months ago, I had a, a conversation with a, a, a Chinese writer, Da Qin, about street art in China. And he told me that there are artists who do their calligraphy on the sidewalks using just a brush and water. Their art will only be visible to passerbys until the water dries. This is not a problem unique to calligraphers. Most art vanishes, and most of it vanishes very quickly. This is why I owe such a debt <coughs> to Mike Whitaker and to, um, for stirring the ashes to this wonderful cast and to all of you for allowing this breath to creep back into this old play one more time. Um, I would now like to turn the podium over.